Trading Nut, episode 57. I know what works for me, and that's a huge part of trading. Find what works for you and do that, and do that only if you can. The market's going to do something. Your job is not to fight it. The market never, ever runs away. It's always there. That personal diary of trading will make you a much better trader than I could be right about the direction, but wrong about the trade. Don't focus on the monetary side. Trying to make too much money on a trade is what I have seen killed every trader. Your losses offer you some of the greatest insight you can find into your mistakes. Relax, learn the process. Candlestick pattern trading is a freaking trap. Don't be in a rush to become a millionaire. Let the market tell you what the market wants to tell you. This podcast is not financial, trading, or investing advice of any kind. What's up traders, welcome to another installment of the Trading Nut Podcast. I'm your host Cam Hawkins and today we've got Kenny Glick on the show. Now Kenny was recommended by Mario Hennenberger from episode 52, so we've got him on. He said this guy's hilarious, he's an ex-stand-up comic and uh, he also started off as a boiler room, room salesman. I don't know if you guys have seen though that movie Boiler Room fantastic movie go and check it out but he was basically selling stocks and shares to uh, unsuspecting um, mum and dad investors out there he would move from that fairly quickly i think from memory to uh to become a uh, professional stock trader himself so guys we're going to get to learn a lot about kenny a lot about how his career as a trader progressed throughout the years uh, to get where he is now we did record this uh, interview uh, on screen, so we've got not just the audio recording, but we've got a video recording of, of it as well. So if you are on YouTube, which I'm guessing most of you are, then head over to the uh, the YouTube channel uh, there at Trading Nut. And also, we did record a little video afterwards as well where he walks through a price chart and shows us some stuff that's not in this show. So plenty of things to do in, after the show. Now, before we get into it, I do want to talk about a couple of things. As I'm doing these days with these little intros, one is, uh, yeah, so I'm listening to these books once a month. I thought, oh, I just need to get this one book. As I said before, I think in an older episode, got the one book. Now I'm on to like book number four, I think it is. Uh, this book is called Game Changer. Game Changers, I think. Funnily enough, it's, it's almost exactly the same title as the movie I talked about a couple of weeks ago, which... Funnily enough, it keeps getting mentioned. The go thing's gone viral. Uh, the doco, it's gone viral. The game changes. I heard on the radio this week. I heard it. Heard it. Um, somebody mentioned. Two different people mentioned it to me, um, and then they asked people had they heard about it. And yep, everyone's heard about it. So I like to think that I was first here, Trading Nut, to get it to you guys, so that you guys got it, got it first from from Trading Nut. Now, forgetting about the the Netflix doco. What I'm talking about today is a book, just happens to have the same title. Uh, it's by a guy called, oh, the name will come to me, the name will come to me. Um, he's the he's the biohacker, he's the guy that does, oh, sorry, Dave Asprey is his name. Uh, he's a biohacker, does the Bulletproof Coffee, he's written this book called Game Changer or Game Changes. And what, uh, I'm going to probably drop a few things from it in the upcoming episodes of Trading Nut. Today I want to talk about what he calls weasel words and these are words you should never say and i think they relate to not just everyday life but also to your trading as well so the words are and there's only four of them which is good easy to remember so the first word is need the second word is can't the third one is try and then the last one is bad now need and lie uh, sorry need and can't are basically lies and that's why you should never say them so need the only thing we really need is is oxygen um, within a few seconds, water within a few days, and uh, food within like a, a few weeks. I suppose shelter as well if it gets too cold or hot, but you know, that's all semantics. So need is one that you shouldn't really say unless it is true. So it's a lie. When you say need, like I need to win this trade, it's a lie. You don't need to win the trade. What's the worst thing that's going to happen if you don't? Okay. Um, the other one is can't. So uh, you just it's a lie again. So there's usually a way around whatever the problem is. So don't say can't. Uh, and then we've got another two. Try. There is no try. It's just do. So you're not going to try to do that. I'm going to try and make it work. You're either going to it's either going to fail or it's not. There's no try. Okay. And the last one is bad. And I can't remember what bad was. But once again, it's a definitive. Thing. It's a definitive, like, I am saying this is bad when, I mean, I suppose, I can't even remember what he said about bad, but look, it's definitive, and usually it's not 
bad, it's just a perception. So what might be bad for one person is good for another. Um, it just depends on how you see it. It's all perspective. So guys, that's my little tip for the day or the week. So four words not to try and not say. We'll try to not to say. I shouldn't say try. Don't say these words. Um, need, can't, try, and bad. Okay, so there we go, guys. And a, the, the trick he had around it was to do something like pay somebody uh, a bit of money every time that you say one of these words, and that's your way of trying to get out of that habit. Now, I've gone on about that a little bit too much. Um, what we, What I do want to mention before we get into the show is... I've had an absolute result here with one of these trading robots we've got in the lab up in the, the Trading Nuts um, Robot Traders Club. Now, by the time you get this, it's probably going to be out of the lab and, and into the into the graduates program that we have. Uh, it's it's done ridiculously well in the first week of trading. I've got one more day to go. We've got one trade running at the moment. It is very aggressive, uh, but it's done a, on a... $100 account, this is just a small test account, it's done 75% in a week, and we've only suffered very little drawdown across that, so, in trading very small lot sizes. So guys, it's, yeah, it's worthwhile checking out, um, I, and as I said, it's probably not going to be, you're not going to be able to get access to it straight away, you'll be able to get in there, you'll probably be able to learn a bit about it and see if it's for you or not, but um, yeah, it's over there in the Robot Traders Club, we've, we've found one that's looking pretty damn good. So it's a it's a combination of a couple of things, right? It's it's not just the bot doing its thing, which it can do, but it's also a bit of human intervention as well. Anyway, right, let's get on with this show, uh, and you're going to hear from Kenny right now. All right, folks, we've got Kenny Glick here from Hit the Bid. How's it going, Kenny? Pretty good, man. How about you? Oh, very good, thank you. So whereabouts are you based again? Somewhere in the States? Yeah, I'm I'm from Brooklyn. Live in New Jersey now. You know, my wife wanted the uh, the house with the the fence and the dog and the two kids, so yeah, I had to move out of Brooklyn. <laughs> oh yeah, good stuff, good stuff. Uh, so heading into winter over there. And um, do you want to tell the guys a little bit about yourself first? Sure. Um, well, I'll get right into it. I've been you know I've been watching the market since uh, got to be fourth or fifth grade. You know, since I was a, a wee lad, and uh, you know, always interested in trying to make money. My dad was always talking mutual funds and that type of thing. And I had a math teacher who gave us a stock market, uh, you know, it was a stock market contest, like in fourth and fifth grade. And for some reason, it really just, it, it really appealed to me just, you know, researching some companies and, you know, just learning a little bit about, you know, what all these na- you know, letters and numbers meant in the, in the New York times. And, uh, from there, um, nice Jewish boy, I had a bar mitzvah and, uh, when I'm 13, we all have this big party and we get a lot of money. So my dad taught me where that money was going to go. And I learned about mutual funds. That interests me also about, you know, money managing and how they pick their stocks and all that type of stuff. Um, Never really got into it, you know, until after college, after that, it was just, you know, a little, you know, I would, I would, uh, back in the day, you had to call your broker. This is all before electronic trading, obviously. Um, You know, I, I think I placed my first trade, I guess, when I was 20. Um, this is, you know, just me just buying some stock, but I never really got into the industry until I was kind of suckered into it more or less because I was doing some stand-up comedy and, uh, somebody approached me at the end of the show and said, Hey, you are a funny guy. Why don't you use your sense of humor to sell worthless piece of shit stocks to unsuspecting victims? He didn't put it like that, (laughs) but that's what it turned out to be. And, um, from boiler room to to, to chop shop, I went for about two years, and really, I mean, the stories that you see, there has been movies that made, you know, Boiler Room, yeah. uh, you know, Wolf of Wall Street, all that stuff was really genuine. I mean, I like Boiler Room better than Wolf of Wall Street because that really hit home to what I went through, the whole Ben Affleck speech, the whole thing, and, you know, getting yelled at and your tie cut and the whole thing. Um, but, you know, fast forward, we're jumping pretty, pretty, pretty far ahead. I was ready to walk away from the industry because – you know, seeing it from that side and how shady it was and really how blatantly criminal it was Mm. when I started really getting to see what it was all about, I was kind of ready to walk away. And, uh, you know, I I, I was at a concert, I think it was a Pearl Jam show, and I saw an old uh, fraternity brother there, and I was telling him my plight, and he was like, hey, look, I'm, I'm opening up my own firm. And I was like, listen, I love you, but 
I'm done. I think I'm done with this industry. He's like, no, no, you got it all wrong. We're not, we're not selling anything. You get to trade your own money. I mean, if you think you know what you're doing, then let's see what you can do. And, you know, we give you some money as part of the firm uh, and you put up some of it and we give you the rest and off you go. And there I went. I mean, I, I knew a little bit about what was going on. And this was before you were even allowed to press the keyboards yourself. You actually, we had a little trading pit in an office and we would yell out our orders. You know, we had the terminal at our desk, but you had to yell the order to the order uh, taker because officially we, we, we weren't licensed. We were just, you know, just an ordinary Joe. Yeah. So I, by law, we had to yell the order to the inputter who was the licensed trader and then they would place the order for us. It would come out on our desk. And then we would watch it and then say, okay, get ready, you know, load to, load to sell 32 and an eighth on AMD. And they would have the order ready. And then you'd scream execute and then you'd get your order done. And wow. then within about six months, you were able to, to place your own trades. Wow. Cool. And so, so at that point, I mean, what were you doing to, to work out when you were going to enter the market? As far as trades, like individual trades? Yeah. Well, individual trades, I, I learned early on that there was uh, one of the guys, that, this uh, guy named Isaac, he, he was at this uh, early firm, and he, you know, he kind of told me about these gaps that the market would have in the morning, and you look for gaps to be filled. So I started focusing my attention on exactly what he was telling me to do, because again, I was, I was learning through just from the guys sitting around me. You know, there's Isaac, there was uh, this guy Joey, this guy Kyle, this guy Ray. And they were already making money doing this. So I said, hey, listen, if you guys are doing it, and they were making like, you know, a couple thousand dollars a day, which was absolutely insane, you know, to make that kind of money. I was still living at home with my family. I went with my parents down in the basement, the whole thing. So I was just playing these, these gaps to be filled. So, for instance, if you had a stock with some news and it was gapped down or up, a lot of times if it was gapped high, you would – fade that trade they called it it was the gap fade and for about a year that's all i did and it was a phenomenal trade you know especially on the ones that were gapped down on what was perceived as bad news if that stock would then retrace that gap and then break the opening price more often than not you would get a pretty decent trade out of it and that was it you know um other than other than that everything else was just you know more like we didn't call it swing trading at that point. We called it just we're investing in the market. So other than just playing these gaps and momentum, um, you know, we had some investments. But when when the software started to get a little bit better and we were able to look at our own level twos and join the market, become our own market maker. Um, back then, you didn't have Arca and EdgeX. It was really just uh, Inca, it was called, and SOS. You probably heard of SOS, right? Yeah, possibly. Maybe not. <laughs> yeah, so was, was the small order execution system. Uh, that's what, yeah, that's yeah. what bore, uh, born all of us. It all came out of that industry. Uh, um, so now yeah. we had access to send orders just like we were market makers. So we could use the so system in something that was called SelectNet where we could watch the level two and you would follow the market maker. So if you saw Goldman Sachs on the offer, you saw how many shares he was looking to sell and you would get to be familiar with which market maker controlled which stock. Everybody knows Cisco, right? There yeah. used to be a company called Ascend, A-S-N-D. For you older traders out there, you probably remember Cisco eventually bought them. But we used to call it the Axe. Once you found out who was the Axe, which one of these market makers controlled the box or controlled the stock, all you would do is watch if Goldman Sachs was on the, was on the offer. If you saw him flip to the bid, you knew that stock was got a good chance of going up. And in, in back in the day, the stocks didn't trade in these penny increments. You were trading in eighths and quarters. So the momentum that would carry a stock, you know, now it's a penny by penny by penny, you'd get eighths of a point, trading in 12 and a half, you know, 12 and a half cents increments. So that momentum would, you know, again, you watch Goldman Sachs go to the bid. We would do what's called an offer swipe. You would send an order and it would blast like thousands of shares to the guys on the offer, sometimes it would spook those guys and they would go to the high bid. So if you're sitting there looking to bid, you know, your ASND at 32 and a quarter and Goldman Sachs is on the offer at 32 and three eighths, you saw Goldman Sachs go to 32 and three eighths, you would start slamming everybody on the offer at 32 and a half. 
If they would go half, the momentum would carry it forward. And again, if you could make 12 and a half cents on 3,000 shares, because generally that was our starting position at that time. We had all the money, you know, we were using the firm's capital, so we had lots of buying power. And if you consistently can make 12 and a half cents on 3,000 shares three or four times a day, suddenly you're, you're making a living and, and then some. And then when the market started getting really, really, you know, expensive in 98, 99, stocks were trading in two, three point increments. So that same momentum that we learned how to trade, now we were making points on these trades. And it was unbelievable. You were making three or four grand on every trade. It wow. was insane. <laughs> and so, so how did things evolve from there? Well, where did it evolve? Well, there was a point where I thought I was invincible, you know, obviously. And, uh, you know, what happened to my original firm was that they started, once decimalization came, you know, they got rid of the fractions and everything went penny increments. And that gave birth to this whole high frequency, gave birth to all the algorithms, and really changed the industry. And my company went with that trend and they decided to go all algo so they mm. basically gave me three months they said listen we're 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 getting rid of all you guys we don't want you here anymore sorry we love you and i'm glad you had a good time and uh we're we're, we're changing the the business model and we don't need any live traders anymore because we're going to do it all algorithmic and they went on to amazing success i mean this was a company that i was there with six employees they wound up selling out to night trading for about 60 million uh, about seven or eight years later. It's pretty cool. Wow. Um, but now, you know, after I've had, uh, I had my George Costanza moment of trading. That was where I couldn't do anything. Right. It was, uh, it was like, I went from doing, I made a lot of money more than I ever thought I would see in, in my lifetime in a very short period of time. Uh, and then I thought I could just invest it. And that's when the market crashed. I gave back about 50% of what I made, you know, 18 months of, generating a huge amount of money. I gave it back in basically a month and a half. Uh, and then, you know, we had 9-11 and, you know, we basically sat around and, you know, didn't do anything for a while. And then it was just, I kind of, I think I had a self-defeatist attitude. And, you know, if you're going into trading and you're kind of not really into it, you're going to lose money. And I sort of wanted to give up, but at the same time, I didn't know what else to do. But then I started losing money every day. And it was like, it was like a joke. And so I made, you know, a couple of years later, I made a website called Suck My NASDAQ, which was basically, I would tell people what I was doing and what I was thinking because I was always wrong. And I was like, listen, there's a million guys telling you how smart they are. I'm going to tell you how dumb I am and how stupid I am and how every trade doesn't work. Just take the other side. You'll make money. <laughs> and it, it kind of caught on. We were getting a lot of laughs out of it. Yeah. And, um, you know, a couple of years later, I... You know, first of all, the NASDAQ wanted their name back. They didn't appreciate the fact that I uh, launched a website called Suck My NASDAQ, even though it wasn't anything about the NASDAQ. It was just more of a self-deprecating kind of uh, humor there. Yeah. But once they, they, uh, they, they sued me, more or less, and I had to give the, the website away. And then Hit the Bid was born. And right around that same time, you know, I started trading well again. And uh, we'll just – let's fast forward. And with about, I would say about uh, in 2012, uh, I found something that really changed the way I trade. Um, somebody, one of the members of my website was looking at the way I plotted my charts and my support and resistance and where I thought stocks would go. You know, if our day trade would become a swing trade, we had ideas where the stock would go. And he said, do you know that you're plotting multiple periodicity VWAP? I had no idea what that even meant. Because I know VWAP is a, you know, it's an intraday tool, kind of what traders gear, you know, try to beat at the end of the day when they're accumulating shares. I never understood why it would have any significance. And he kept telling me, listen, just do what you do, but also watch what I'm going to show you. So I took his, his indicator and his coding. I put it on my chart. And for six months, I couldn't believe what I was watching. Really? They were, the, the VWAP was giving me a heads up, you know, Trades that I was thinking about doing, it was alerting me to the point, you know, you know, 15, 20 cents, 20 cents, 30 cents. And if we're talking about, again, if you're talking about a $12 stock or a $15 stock, 20 or 30 cents for a day trader is, you know, it's, a, it's a nice heads up. So I started watching the VWAP and this multiple period VWAP. And my God, 
the stocks would just travel from the one over and over again. Gaps were being filled, and the VWAP was giving me an indication about the trade that I was in love with from 1999. Here I am in 2012. All these years later, the VWAP's giving me a heads up and a better entry before that gap would even be filled. And since 2012, it's all I use. It's the only indicator. It's the only line on my chart. I got the one minute and I've got what we call the multi-day, which can give me any data of the VWAP over any period of time I choose. And since 2012, it's, I'll, I'll never ever use anything else because it seems to be getting better and better as years go by because I believe that more and more people are using it and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now that more people are using it, it seems to be getting better. And whatever the case is, these last 18 months I've been, I, I, I've legitimately never seen anything like it. And, and was that, can I ask the question? Because I know um, Mario uh, Hinnenberger was the one that recommended I interview you. So was he the one who got you onto VWAP? Because he trades VWAP. Uh, no. Originally, it was Zach Hurwitz. I don't know if you know him, but he was interviewed by Chat with Traders. He was on there. He suggested to have me on with Chat with Traders. Uh, Zach also is a disciple of uh, Brian Shannon. Brian Shannon has what's called the anchor VWAP. It could take, you could take any, basically any pivot point you want, any time frame you want, just click a few buttons on the, on the, uh, on the chart and you're going to get a pretty good VWAP indication of, uh, that time frame. I tend to use the standards, something like Zach showed me. I like to grab the data from, uh, yesterday, yesterday's pre-market, yeah. yesterday's full day, to yesterday's aftermarket and what's going on today. So basically, it's grabbing the data from any period I want. And the day trading, the, the purest of day trades, is the one minute to that one day, I call it. And then if the trend starts to continue and follow along, that's when you start looking at the two-day, the three-day, the four-day. And you know sometimes we're looking at monthlies and, and yearlies. So it, it, it's something that had to be proven to me that it worked this well. And like I said, I'll never use anything else before ever again well and so if you had to sort of walk us through like some of the stats that you're getting now with the vwap i mean and the strategy you're using what does that look like stats as far as um success rate yeah success rate um how long you're in, in a trade the risk to reward ratio that sort of thing well this is just it, again this might sound ridiculous but there's one situation it's on an earnings gap if it breaks the one minute and gets through the multi-day and it's going green or red simultaneously, the trade works every time. Wow. I know that's hard to believe, but it's, 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 not, it's not a trade that you find too often. But when it does arise, the trade generally follows through. And when I say follows through, sometimes if you're talking about a stock, let's, again, let's look at a, well, AMD staring me in the face right now because I still have my uh, monitor open. So let's take a look at AMD, right? If AMD tomorrow gaps down, and it breaks over the one minute and gets through the multi-day, and then it goes green, basically, let's call it 90% to be fair. It doesn't work every single time. Lately, it has. But if you get through the one minute and you get through that multi-day VWAP and you get that stock to now close that gap and go from red to green, 90% of the time, the stock follows through. So if you're buying it tomorrow at $33 or wherever it closed today and you get through that 33 chances are you should be buying it at 33 and you're probably going to get paid on average, if it's a $33 stock, you're looking to make at least 40 or 50 cents, which, again, for a day trader, that's a day's pay right there. You buy 2,000 shares of AMD, it pops 50 cents in about a half an hour, because that's generally the time frame that we're looking at. The momentum, usually it's a half hour, maybe an hour. Yeah. And then we decide what we want to do next. So if you're buying 2,000 shares of AMD tomorrow at 33, you get to 33, 30, if you get to 33 and a quarter, we'll start selling a couple of hundred shares just to lock into some profit. And then we put our stop at the break even. So now we take a few, you know, we take some money off the table. We put the stop at break even. So now we can't lose. And as the trade continues to work, we check the multi-day VWAP where our next target could be. And then that's where we start offering it out. So either we're going to get stopped out or we're going to offer out at a higher price. And once it gets to that next VWAP, that becomes our new stop. And we piece out of the position. You know, anybody that says they buy it at this one price and sell the whole thing 
at one price, you really shouldn't do that. You know, you have to take profit along the way. And even when the trades don't work, we don't get stopped out at all at one price. You want to scatter your stops also. And we use the multi-day VWAP for that as well, because generally there's going to be a VWAP somewhere that gives you a decent, you know, risk reward. So as far as the risk reward, now, if we're going to talk dollar amount, mm. if we're talking about a $33 stock and it just, and this just broke the VWAP, generally your risk reward is you're, you're risking about a quarter to make 50 cents. Or, you know, if you're talking about a Beyond Meat or something like an Amazon, obviously you're talking different numbers, you know, but it's generally a couple of different, it's a couple of candles back. We're looking at the, the prior multi-day VWAP. And again, I don't want to, you know, a lot of this stuff is more, obviously, when you see it on the chart, it pops other than me just talking about it. You know, you see it. You can see where that stock, okay, if it breaks here, you're looking at a 50 or 60 cent gain. If it doesn't work out, you're looking at a 20 cent gain. I think that answers the question about as far as risk reward. It's always stock specific. If you're trading Amazon, you're not risking 30 cents. I mean, you're obviously risking three or four dollars because that move, that stock's moving in three or four point increments. So it's really just, you know, again, stock specific, but generally, let's put it this way, risk reward is always in your favor. And that's a good thing. You're taking high probability trades. Risk reward is usually in your favor. And what was the third thing that you wanted to know? The uh, the winning, yeah, the winning percentage on, on sort of, I suppose, overall with all your trading and even how many trades you'd do in one day. Today, very li- I am very limited to what I do now because I refuse to trade anything else. You know, some guys say, well, what if it pulls back and it finds some support in the middle of the day? If there's not a VWAP and a range break involved, usually I'm not interested. I mean, today it was beyond me long at the open, looking for it to close that gap. Uh, and we had uh, work, W-O-R-K, breaking over uh, the opening range again. It's a very specific trade. Once you get over that one minute and you're breaking the opening range, basically your five-minute candle from 9.30, 9.35, nine, you know, and all, you know, sometimes a 15-minute candle. I, I find the 15-minute range break is the best. So if you're over the one minute and you're over that 15-minute candle, generally you're going to get some follow-through. So, you know, for me, it's so specific. And what I like about it is that it keeps me disciplined. I'm only looking for... A variety of, you know, it's one trade. There's about four or five varieties of it. It's the gap that fail, the gap that fails from a gap up. There's the gap that closes from the gap down. And then you have the just the opening range break up or down. So very specific. And that's what's great about it is that you're instilling discipline in your trading. Because here I am, I don't care about some small cap stock that's blasting off. I don't care. You know, I have guys in my chat room, what about this? What about that? What about this? I don't care. If it's not a VWAP reversal, I'm not taking it. I got a 90% chance of success on this trade. Whatever you're doing, it's 50-50 at best. Yeah. So I'm going to stick with what I do. Let me show you what I do. And then if you want to gamble on something else, do it after you make money on these high probability trades. And, and what, uh, how do you pick your stocks? All stocks that are in the news. So this is why this is my busy season. So every day, I'm looking at who reported the night before and who reported this morning. So obviously beyond me this morning. Uh, Tomorrow we'll we'll all be over uh, AMD. Uh, We were looking at Twitter the other day. So the VWAP, you know, obviously, I don't know if everybody knows what that stands for. It's volume weighted average price. So when do you get the most volume? When the stock's in the news. When's the stock in the news? During earnings season. I love upgrades. I love downgrades because that produces more volume and the volume weighted average price tends to work better during these gap areas. So you're going to get these gaps during earnings. You're going to get more volume. And that's why we trade again. I'll, I'll take a month off from trading during when, when there's no earnings. I mean, I'll sit around, you know, August is usually a dead month. I mean, lately August has been a lot of fun, but when there's no earnings and there's no gaps, you know, again, I just try to stay disciplined. I know there's always something to do. I get it, and I've been I've, I've traded a million different styles. But now I'm old. I'm old. I just want to trade VWAP. It's crazy. Why would you trade anything else? Yeah, it, it works eighty to ninety percent of the time. So again, 
it sounds absurd when I say that, even when I say it out loud, 80 to 90%. It's a, such a specific trade, and it really does. When it's, when it's going well, you'll never you, – you just don't lose. And when you do have that losing trade, the entry is so good that your minimum you're, – you're taking very minimum losses. And, and what does your typical day look like? Typical day? Oh, man. Let's see. My wife's awake. My kids are going to school. I'm trying to stay asleep. Uh, I'll, I'll crawl out of bed around 8.30, see what, what kind of economic data came out. Not that it really matters to me too much, but I'll take a look at what's gapping. You know, obviously, I'm looking at who reported that morning. And then by, you know, by 9 o'clock, I'm building the ranges from the knee-jerk reaction on those news reports or that was those earnings report, more or less. So where the stock spiked to, where, you know, a lot of times you'll get this massive candle on the report because everybody reacts to the earnings per share. Then they react to the guidance. And then they, there's another reaction to the conference call. So I'll plot all that. And the reason VWAP is great is that now that you have this report coming out, usually, you know, 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning, you're going to get a pretty decent VWAP and a decent range formation right before the open. And then, obviously, we're waiting for those first five minutes of just crazy choppiness. And once that, you know, subsides, we start to form the range. But, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't even get up before 8.30 in the morning anymore. You know, I, I kind of know what I'm going to be trading already tomorrow. And, again, and then I just, you know, I get on the air. I do a broadcast on, on my website. I show my screen. And I just get on my microphone. I got my fancy microphone. I don't know if you can see it, but my old school mic. Like I'm some yeah, yeah, yeah. From... <laughs> yeah, Very dude. nice. And, uh, you know, I just get on the mic and I, you know, I, I talk like we're talking right now. I'm like, here we got AMD looking at 3265. The VWAP's 3275. Breaks 3275. We're looking for 3315 on the trade. And if I'm doing a trade specifically, I say, like, all right, guys, I'm in this thing at 3275. Our stop is 3260. And then you see, your, you see my charts and you see my trades right up on the screen. And again, most of the time, I'm more of a, uh, a guru, I guess you would call it. I talk a lot more than I trade. And I used to be, you know, I, I guess I, I used to be skeptical of guys that would do that. Because I said, hey, look, if you don't have any skin in the game, why should I believe you? But now I'm at the point where, listen, if the, if the information is good, if the advice is good and obviously the trade's working live, what do you care if I'm in the trade or not? I'm here to help you. Yeah. And here I am doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And again, as long as, you know, and there's a lot of guys, I, I've been doing this on YouTube since 2007. There was maybe four of us. Now there's about 100 guys on YouTube talking about how smart they are and how awesome they are. Now, if they're pretending to trade and saying how much money they're making, that's the scam. If they're just talking advice and they're paper trading and they're just trying to help people, I used to condemn those guys, but now I sort of am one of those guys and I'm not embarrassed about it. If I take one or two trades, but I talk about eight other ones and, you know, seven out of my 10 trades worked and I only took two, everybody's happy. We all making money. That's, that's really what it's all about. Nice. Well, look, um, well, if you sort of take yourself back to the beginning, it sounds like you, you were pretty successful straight out of the gates, which is not the common story that I get here on the show. Um, it usually takes people sort of seven or eight years to, to get going. I mean, what, what do you think made you different from everyone else out there? I think because I was very selective right from the beginning. And, you know, again, there was that two-year, three-year period where I couldn't do anything right. You know, I, I just lost my way. So it's like I had a, the backwards. Usually it's everybody has a struggle at the beginning. Um, I just had a knack for the trade. I stuck with what I, what I liked, what I knew, and it really clicked for me right away. And that, moment, that momentum trade and just sticking with, you know, following the market maker, just trying to make my eighths and quarters. But then when I started getting, you know, a little bit conceited and arrogant, thinking I could do no wrong, that's when I started losing money, holding positions that went against me, not wanting to take a loss, ego getting in the way, the whole thing. Um, so I had to fight through that. And then again, trading is an evolution. Usually you're right. Most people have struggles at the beginning and they find their way. 
for me, I had something that was working and I, I went away from it and I couldn't find my way back. I mean, it was, it was crazy. And I, I, I call it a spirit walk. I, I used to go, I would go to my office and not even put my computer on. I mean, my wife thinks I was going to work every day. I was wandering around the city <laughs> like, a, like a lunatic, you know, just, you know, looking for something to do. I, I, went, I used to go to the movie theater and watch anything, any movie that was out, you know, over and over again and just, you know, for a good six months. And then I cleared my head and went back. I said, all right, now I'm going to do, I'm going to go back to exactly what was working and nobody's going to tell me anything else. And, you know, again, and that led me back to making money again. And, you know, where I am right now is, is this is, this is the most happy I've been in the industry in a long, long time, because I don't care what people think. I know, I, they know that they know that I'm not taking all these trades that I announce in my room. And I don't think anybody cares. You know, I used to be really hard on myself because I wanted to be in every single trade, Yeah. but you can't, you can't. I'm, I'm talking, I'm trying to trade, I'm, listen, I'm taking phone calls, I'm sending emails. I'm basically running a whole company here while I'm trying to trade. It's hard. So I'll take my one or two trades and then I'll sit back and, you know, try to, try to help other people. And, uh, I mean, yeah, I suppose the question I got on my mind is, did, did you seek out education of any sort? No, I was, well, I had my mentor back in the day, uh, this guy, Isaac and, you know, Joey and Kyle, but they, um, you know, they went on to bigger and better things. And, you know, as far as education, the education for me came coincidentally from Zach, who came into my chat room and said, Hey, do you know that your, your, your trend lines and you're, you're plotting your own VWAP. And I was, you know, again, once again, I said, you know, I don't get it. Why would VWAP even matter? And my God, it, it just opened my eyes. So really, my trading career really was reborn, if you will, yeah. in 2012. You know, I, I, and then I had one year where I just, again, my, my, what I thought, and I think one of the most important part, you know, one of the important parts of trading that people need to realize that we know nothing. We control nothing at all. I mean, these, these stocks, these stocks can do whatever they want, the they, the manipulation, whatever it is, it's rigged, it's manipulated, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fraud, it's a scam, it's all true, it's all true. <laughs> so all we try to do is, we're just trying to eke out something in the middle of all this craziness. And once you accept that you really don't know, and you just live by the VWAP, that's all you need. Because there was a point, I think, got to be... Uh, right. So the market started rallying in 2009. We had this monster move, 10, 12. I guess it was basically 2013, 2014, where I said, you know what? That's enough. I mean, this market's got to roll over and give back something. And I just, I didn't care. I, I didn't even care what I was looking at. I thought I was right. I felt it. And I just went with my gut and I was really, really wrong. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't have been wrong. I couldn't have been more wrong. And that's when I became this psychotic bull again. I was like, listen, if the market's never going to go down and the government controls it, I'm just going to ride the wave, baby. Woo! Let's just go. Government's going to run the market at 20,000. And I was like, the market's going to hit 20,000 on January 17th, 2017 at 1.43 in the morning. And I said that six years before it happened. And I was only four days off. Wow. It was unbelievable. Because <laughs> I was just looking at the trajectory of the market and I just did a couple of, I did some math with some percentages. I said, we're probably going to rally for the next eight years. And then I was like, yeah, all right, we'll get through the election. And we'll probably rip right to 20,000. I was off by a week. Wow. I was off by a week. Yeah. So it's a pretty good call. My dad is the only one that really, my dad's still in the market from that day. He bought into the QQQ uh, basically, you know, 2010. Cost average is around 50. I convinced him to hold on to 10 years, even though I've, <laughs> Also told him to sell in 27, 2016, 17, yeah. 18. I've been begging him to sell at least a dozen times since. But my man, my dad has held throughout this whole time. And he's still in the QQQ from the day he bought it, you know, back in uh, 2009. Unbelievable. And he bought a little bit more in 2010, 2011. Phenomenal trade. I mean, and he's still in it. 
incredible. I mean, so it sounds like you. I mean, you had a bit of bit of luck along the way, and for whatever reason, you decided to take this advice on. You know, looking at the VWAP, and I suppose it's because it was correlated to what you're already doing, and it made sense. I mean, what do you recommend for guys out there who are who are struggling? That you know, they're paying for education, they're um, trying out different things, nothing's really clicking. What What do you recommend they do? I'm gonna beat a dead horse here. VWAP is the way. I'm telling you, I've been doing. I've been watching the markets for 25 years. I've never seen anything that's more accurate. Um, what because it is the market. Volume weighted average price is the market. So again, trying to pick an individual stock. We're not talking about investing. Okay, you want to pick an individual stock? I go QQQ. I'll buy the market. You know, you want to talk about swing trading? As soon as you take the stock overnight, you're now at the mercy of so many different circumstances, right? You don't know what's going to happen. News, some sort of tweet, a war breaks out. There's a million things that could happen. Yeah. I like to stay focused on what I can control, and it's very limited. I can control what's going on during the day. And what's the number one thing to watch? Volume weighted average price. Because it's going to tell you what you should do because it's telling you where the money is. You know, the idea of the volume weighted average price is, you want to know where the big guys are making money. Kenny Glick's not running anything. You know, my thousand shares ain't changing the fate of AMD. It traded 78 million shares today. My thousand or 2,000 shares means nothing, absolutely nothing. I want to know where the money went into this stock. So the volume implies money, where the most volume of that stock went into the market. So that is the lifeline of the market. So if you're in a trade, and you're thinking, all right, I'll hang on to this level. I'll hang on to that level. If it breaks this, I'm going to get out. The VWAP is that line. If you're in a trade and it's going against you, don't let it break the VWAP. Mm. Because once it breaks the VWAP, that is not only just usually an algorithmic move, or let me just say it's more of a, it's a sentiment. It's a sentiment indicator. It's an algorithmic indicator. And it's just, it's a trading indicator. Once you're back below or above the VWAP, the, the, the market and the stock changes. So if you've got the, we, you've got the one minute VWAP and you've got that multi-day, you have a roadmap to success. And again, don't take my word for it. You know, let me show you what it's all about. Nobody does what I do in, in this industry. I, I do a 30 day trial because if somebody wants to succeed in this industry, you're not going to learn how to trade by reading a book or paying somebody $600 for a class. Come and learn the way I learned 25 years ago by sitting next to a guy who's doing it. And let me show you how amazing the VWAP is. Here, look, this is what it did. You see it, what it's doing. There's no denying it just happened right before your very eyes. So again, since 2012, I can't stress enough. If you're struggling, VWAP. If you're getting into this industry for the first time, VWAP's all you need. If you're trying to, you know, swing trade, multi-day VWAP. It is the roadmap to success. It truly is. I can't say enough. And so if somebody sort of takes the VWAP on board, I mean, is there anything else you'd recommend they, they look at to accompany it, like either to exit the trade or, or to give them sort of, you know, more confirmation that they're, they're doing the right thing? There's a combination. You know, we, again, because I've been trading so long, I, I also set up what we call ranges, all right? You're looking at these candlesticks, and you're looking at, you know, a stock today, for, for instance, was Grubhub. You know, if you, guys are, if you guys want to take a look at this chart, stock got absolutely annihilated today. So there was no VWAP play at all, except for when it came out of the bottom range. Let me see if I can find it for you. Um, but... The, the idea is that you're looking at these stocks and just your, tep, your typical support and resistance. If every time you get to a certain price, and you got to understand something about this market, because of the decimalization, a lot of these stocks are triggered by an if-then statement. So if the stock gets to 32.78 and gets rejected and then it goes, starts to go back down, it goes right back to 32.78 and it gets rejected. Our VWAP is up there at $34, if you're following me here. So if you keep getting to the same price, that's your top of your range. And the VWAP is on top. This is what we call the reversion 
to the mean or the average price. So if you're bouncing and you keep getting rejected by one price, what do you think you should do if it finally does break that price? That's a range break, buy the stock. And now you're looking at prior prices that the stock, you know, again, this is typical support resistance, but now because of decimalization, it really comes down to sometimes a penny where that penny will then trigger the next algorithm because it's if then statement. If 3268 mm. prints, then bring the stock to the next VWAP. So again, what I try to show people how to do is to plot their own ranges above and below the VWAP, the VWAP. And then if you get the range break, you're usually reverting back to it from a what we call the blow off top. If it's something that's been going parabolic to the upside or your capitulation, if something's been getting slammed all day like a Grubhub and you finally get that move to the upside. And again, it might sound simple. It is. It, 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 I, I've, I've made this to the point where within six months, you're going you're gonna to know what to do. It really, it really dumbs it down. You know, that's what's great about it. You know, sometimes, and it's funny because, you know, I get emails all the time and somebody says, well, all that's, all that's well and good. What about this? No, no what about this? There is no what about this. It works 80% of the time. And I'm talking to you, Deb. I don't get it. I have a woman that's debating whether or not she wants to join, <laughs> join the website. And she keeps asking me about other trades. And I was like, don't you understand this trade works 80% of the time? There's no other trade to do. And that's my true opinion. And that's really what you should focus on. And over and over again, oh, what about this? What about that? No, I don't care about stochastics and Bollinger Bands and Ichiro clouds and all types of momentum shifting and pivot points. And I mean, if you look at Thinkorswim or any platform, right? There is 10,000 studies to choose from. I've, you don't need them. You don't need them. VWAP is all you need. There you go, guys. So, and then if you want to jump back to another episode, check out Mario where he sort of went through the VWAP as well in the Forex markets, so slightly different. Uh, Righty ho, are we going to jump into the quick fire rounds here, Kenny? So um, the first question is, how long did it take you to go from newbie to consistently profitable? Well, for me, it was a little bit, you know, uh, kind of like was profitable right away, which was odd, you know, because I went from being a stockbroker and I kind of had a feel for the stocks and how they moved. So I was kind of in the ebb and flow right away. So for me, but yeah, for me, it was like I was lucky. You know, I started off on the right foot. And, you know, again, like I said, somewhere in, in between, I, I, I kind of lost my way. But uh, I, I would say, again, from 2012 to where we are right now, really has been the sweet spot of, of, of my trading. Next question. So what's your mental approach to trading and do you have any special techniques you can share with the listeners? Well, the, it, it's kind of like, you know, I, I don't know if anybody's ever been to AA or if they've had alcohol problems or drug addictions. You, a lot of people become addicted to this and the, the, it, it's a mental game. You know, that's why finding the VWAP trade is the easy part. It's being addicted to this game, not getting out of your chair. You know, there's a, there's, there's a point where between 9.30 and 11.30, that's where we find our best trades. And what happens is, let's say some of our trades don't work out. And next thing you know, you're going into what you know is probably the worst time to trade between 12 and 1. But you're so bent and on tilt and addicted that you're sitting there and you're fighting against the market and generally you make it worse. So there's a point and a lot of people, a lot of traders don't realize you just have to walk away because in this casino, and it is a casino, there's nobody coming with drinks. There's no show if you stay at the table long. Nobody's giving you a, a free stay at the hotel Nobody's giving you anything. They're just taking your money. Sometimes you've got to get up. You've got to admit defeat because there are days, listen, if something works 80% of the time, remember, there's going to be that day where you're the 20% guy and everything you do is wrong. You just got to suck it up. And you got to realize tomorrow's a brand new day. 
and tomorrow could be the 80 the 80 percent or even the 100 percent day so finding the trades is is the easy part i know that sounds crazy but it's the mental game and just knowing that don't 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 fall into the traps of being being addicted revenge trading you know if you're if the stock basically i say the stock owns you there are certain stocks that just can't trade there's something about them they don't move according to what works with me the ebb and flow of the stock's not right the the volume's not right and what i because i'm a, a decent trader i want to conquer that stock but at one point you got to realize you know what the stock owns me i just have to accept it i'm not trading that stock anymore and i ban it yeah i have a whole list of banned stocks <laughs> right. I've taken them. I, I've taken them off my scanners. I've taken them off my ticker. And if anybody mentions it in my website, they're they're fine. Fifty bucks. <laughs> <laughs> really? How do you get them yeah. to pay that? <laughs> I, I don't. It's just <laughs> <laughs> theoretically. <laughs> but uh, they they understand. Yeah. There are just some stocks like like again like uh, Alibaba, and I, I just can't make money on the stock no matter what happens. It, it, it could it could do exactly what I think it's going to do, break my VWAP and the multi VWAP, somehow I always lose money. Square, another one. So I just avoid them. I know I know what works for me, and that's a huge part of trading. Find what works for you and do that, and do that only yeah. if you can. Yep. Um, what's your favorite entry setup? Mm. My favorite of all time is the the – the upgrade that well it, there's a, there's two of them i i love them both because they're so fun and ironic i like a stock that's gapped down on bad earnings uh and then winds up going through the one minute in the multi-day and going green because that is a it's a shock trade because most people are reading the headlines on yahoo finance they're they're looking at uh they're, they're listening to cnbc and they're hearing all this bad news and they're immediately thinking all right, this thing, this thing's going to be a short. Not me. I'm already, I'm again, Grubhub being the exception today. There was no love for that stock today. But generally, a stock that's gapped down, mm. there's going to be some buying. Amazon the other day, Goldman Sachs, obviously. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. I love that trade. And it's an easy trade because it's going against the grain. So you have, you know, a lot of, panicky shorts starting to cover especially on the one that's you know again like i said gap down on bad earnings and then if it doesn't get worse near the open you're going to get this beautiful reversion to the vwap and it's a phenomenal trade the only one that makes me smile even more is the moron analyst trade and i'm and these guys are morons i mean you got a stock that's been going down for six months and then finally some genius puts a sell recommendation on it. Stock's down 85%. Oh, 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 is it now is a good time to sell? And usually that's the, that's the end of the downtrend. Some guy puts a sell recommendation on it, on a stock that's down 70, 80%. And when those go, you know, those break back above the VWAP, more often than not, you actually get the stock going green that day. Or, you know, again, the same, on the same, uh, same idea as when, you got a stock that's been going up for a year and some guy puts some crazy buy recommendation on it. And of, and of course the stock tanks that day. It, I, I love going against the analysts because they really don't know what they're talking about. I mean, that's why this industry to me is just a joke because these guys went to school. I went to, I went to school to make TV commercials and, you know, work, work television equipment and, and acting. And I know now probably more than any of these guys I don't care what numbers you could crunch. I failed accounting, all right? The one class I failed in accounting, I didn't really go to the class because I was too busy raving, but um, <laughs> I don't know anything about fundamental analysis, and I don't need to. That's why I love what I do, because these guys are – I'm not going to say I'm smarter than them. Oh, they're smarter than me. I mean, I can't even hold a conversation with some of these guys. You want to start talking about, you know, EBITDA and earnings per mm. share and – you know, and balance sheets, I have no idea what you're talking about, but I don't, but I don't need to. And every time the market crashes, it proves that really nobody knows anything, even in this market, how it goes up every day. I mean, it's, it's defying all kinds of logic, you know, it's not supposed to go up every day, but it is what it is. And I just stay focused on, you know, what I can control and, you know, look for those gaps to be uh, filled and analysts to be wrong. 
What's your recommended trading book? Ah, uh, my, I I love anything written by uh, Jeff Hirsch, Stock Traders Almanac, Seasonality. He's a great author. He's a smart guy, awesome guy. Um, his his family invented the Stock Traders Almanac. Dale Hirsch was his father. Jeff is is his son. Very smart guy, and I just I just like what he has to say. I, I, it's it's straightforward and it's easy to absorb. Um, if you haven't read, if you haven't read, um, what's the one? Uh, well, the, uh, what's the one that everybody loves so much? Market the, Wizards, uh, Remnants, Remnants. Is a, yeah, Remnants is sort of a stock, stock operator. Yeah, that's, that's always yeah. a good read. Yeah. <laughs> and if you want to read something entertaining, read. Uh, I think it's called. Uh, yeah, I'll give you a plug. Josh Brown's book. There you go. Backstage Wall Street by Josh Brown. It's uh, it's a fun read. Oh, okay. it's, you know, yeah. behind the scenes, uh, not specifically about trading, but an entertaining take on uh, on Wall Street. But as far as technical analysis, again, you want to read anything by Brian Shannon. Uh, he ta- he has a book. Um, I forgot the title of it. I could give it to you in a second. But if you want to read something that's going to change the way you look at trading, Brian Shannon. Uh, let's see what the name of the book is. Something about multiple periodicity VWAPs. Uh, let's let me get it for you. Technical. Oh, it's a pretty big title for a book, but technical analysis using multiple time frames. <laughs> Understand market structure and profit from trend alignment. Well, wow. he wrote it ten years ago, so <laughs> he, he is the godfather of VWAP. Basically, right. I, I call him the godfather of VWAP. Cool. Okay. And um, what if there was one thing you'd recommend a, a retail trader spend the next month mastering, what would it be? Why? And how could they go about mastering it? I missed the first part of that question. Oh, if you could recommend one thing a retail trader could spend the next month mastering, what would it be? What do you think I'm going to say? I think you're probably going to say um, something like uh, the Bollinger Bands or something. I've got no idea. <laughs> Moving average. I love, I love the 20 minute EMA. <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> Uh, master, master building ranges around VWAP. I mean, it really is uh, incredible. Or what I would suggest, if, if, if you're not going to jump into trade, right, just follow the one minute on stocks that are gapped up just to see how they react when they get near it and when they break it. And that's how I learned. You know, again, I just sat back for six months and I just watched this in absolute amazement. And it really is, it really is incredible. Then if you want, there's a few. There's a volume profiler. If I'm going to stray from the path of pure VWAP, something about volume profiler had been interesting. Uh, Camilla pivot points were interesting because there you're kind of getting the turn on the stock before you're, you're reverting mm-hmm. to the VWAP. So that was kind of interesting for a while. But I'm pretty skilled in finding my own ranges. So I- I'm assuming that a lot of those studies and indicators – I'm already doing it inertly because I've been staring at the screen for 25 years. But again, they're, they're, it's, it's, it's one line, the, the one minute VWAP. It's, and again, it, it's still not standard on a lot of platforms. I think there's a conspiracy because it's definitely something you need and it's not on every platform. Yeah. And I think they're, keep, they're trying to keep it a secret, you know? And, you know, my father tells me, he's like, listen, why don't, why do you even tell anybody about this? He's like, if it works for you, just sit in your sit in your room and do it yourself and shut up. I'm like, yeah, but I think if I tell more people it works, it seems to be working better every year. So I'm gonna scream scream it as much as I can. It, 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 again, I've never I've never seen it. I've never seen anything work like that. You know, amazing, amazing. It's it's, it's again, I, I'm almost 50 years old. I've been doing this my whole life at this point. And I'm still amazed every day. Yeah. So that's saying something. What's your preferred broker and trading platform? Right now, if it's free, it's for me. I mean, this is incredible. These are incredible times where these guys are all racing to zero. The only thing is, the better platform is going to cost you a little bit. So I hate promoting this platform, and I'm not promoting it in any way, because if you could figure out how to get a platform that's free, Thinkorswim is the best, because the charts are the greatest. You have your indicators on there. There's a lot of stuff. You can do your own coding. And obviously it's free, but 
I don't really trade on there. I trade on, uh, I trade on light speed. You know, again, I was familiar with that from, you know, a decade ago. So uh, I used to use Sterling, anything where I have access to a level two, where I could basically click a price and send an order. You know, that's the kind of platform I like, but right now I've gone back to E-Trade because, um, I was using a company called Options House, and I was uh, grandfathered in with my rate. I'm paying 15 cents per contract, and now there's no fee on top of that. So I could do 10 contracts now for a buck fifty. This is the cheapest it's ever been, and so I basically use, you know, I teach guys on on uh, Lightspeed just to get familiar with all the bells and whistles of trading and reading the level twos. But nowadays, I've been placing my trades on uh, E-Trade and also, I hate to say this, but Schwab, because I really hate Schwab. <laughs> but they, they, bought out, they bought out Options House, uh, Options Express, yeah. sorry. So I used to be on Options Express and Options House. Options House got bought out by E-Trade. Options Express got bought out by Schwab. So now I'm forced to trade on those two platforms. They're, they're all right. I mean, there's a lot of different things and again, for someone who is pseudo active, it's it's perfect for me. You know, it's free. I get my executions, and you know, the the platform is pretty pretty easy to get to get to know, get to use. Do you want to talk us through your worst ever trade? Wow, worst ever. Uh, yeah, there's two of them. I mean, there was there was one IPO. This was back in you know ninety nine two thousand where. All you did was buy a couple of thousand shares of any IPO that came out at the open and you'd make 20 points. Uh, I think it was, if I can remember, I think it was CSIQ because I still have the scars. No, 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 not CSIQ. Um, I can't remember the symbol, right. but oh my God, this stock opened up at 80 bucks. And I was like, I don't care what the stock is. I'm in 3,000 shares at the open. This thing tanked 20 points within got to be two minutes. I was down 60 grand in uh, got to be two minutes, and I didn't know what to do. I was just like, well, I guess I own this stock for the rest of my life, <laughs> and it just kept tanking. And I was just like, holy shit, I'm down 100 grand on this trade. Holy shit. And thank God it bounced back to me being only down 60, and I took that 60 grand loss like a champ. Uh, about four or five years later, that stock finally actually got past that price. Wow. And But – that wasn't the worst trade. The worst trade of my life was um, that one I was talking about where I thought I was king of the world and I picked the top of the market. I think it was 2012, 2012 2013. Um, the market had finally rolled over, and I was shorting the queues, and I just sold out of them. So I was like, wow, I'm the greatest trader in the world. I'm selling, out, I'm selling the top, and I'm going to go short. And it was working. You know, I had... 8,000 shares of the QQQ short. And then I started buying contracts, in the money contracts on, with puts. So I'm buying 100 contracts, 200 contracts, 300 contracts. And then I got up to about 800 contracts. So I was like, screw it. I'll just buy 200 more because I've never had 1,000 contracts of anything. This is fun. <laughs> so I had 1,000 contracts and 8,000 shares short, and it's going my way. And I'm, I'm running through the office, high-fiving people. Woo! I think I was up about 40 grand on the trade for a second. And then somebody said, you better get back to your desk. There was some like huge announcement. The market's ripping, bro. I'm like, what are you talking about? I was just in my office three minutes ago, up 40 grand. By the time I walked back into the office, down 40 grand. So I'm trying to see what the hell just happened. So apparently JP Morgan or Morgan Stanley put a buy recommendation on basically everything. Right. They said the market's never going down ever again. <laughs> Today is the day you want to buy everything. <laughs> and the market took off. And I legitimately didn't, again, deer in the headlights. My mouth is dry. I feel like I had somebody sitting on me. And, you know, I didn't even get over the point where I just let 40 grand profit turn into a 45, 60 grand loss. Next thing you know, it's at 120. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to lose my house and my family and my life here. So I, I didn't want to give up completely because I thought, you know, because the market went parabolic. So I figured, all right, the, par the parabolic move will probably be, be met with uh, a little retrace. No retrace. So I took half off, 
you know, I took I took about a sixty grand hit, which was from a forty grand profit, yeah. and I decided to hold a little bit overnight. Oh man, we gapped up the next day, started taking off again. So basically, I took a forty grand profit, turned it into about a hundred and sixty thousand dollar loss. Wow. It was pretty sick. Pretty sick. Okay. On that note, um, if you could leave our listeners with one piece of advice, what would it be? Uh, the really is to check your emotions at the door. You know, admit admit that you're powerless to this market, and it really does help you. You know, find that that niche that you want. And again, obviously for me, it's the VWAP and the reversals and reversion trades and range breaks. I found my niche. I believe I could teach anybody how to do that. But still, if ego gets in the way, and I tell this to a lot of guys, I can give you a trade that works 90% of the time, and you'll probably find a way to screw it up because you'll be scared or you'll, you're over traded or you take too much size at the wrong time or back to that whole concept of revenge trade. Some stocks just don't work well with the VWAP. There's not enough volume. The spread's too big. And you think that you're going to conquer that stock because you're so good and you're so smart. Check that at the door. You know nothing. You're powerless to the market. Find, find what works for you and stick with it. Cool. Now, look, the last question of the show, which I ask to my, all my guests, is we'd like you to give us the bones of a trading strategy. So entry, setup, stop loss, take profit targets, market time frame. Basically, something our listeners can have a bit of a play with at home this week. You want particular uh, particular stock trade? Yeah, like a not a particular trade, but more of a, a sort of generic. You sort of you've given us the the basis of it during the course of the interview. Maybe you could just sort of all piece it all together around the VWAP. Okay, this is one we're in right now. It's uh, sp- I'll give you stock specific. It's a stock that just absolutely getting annihilated. It's uh, Slack. Uh, the name of the company is Slack, but the symbol is Work. Oh, yeah. It finally caught a bottom yesterday. And again, I'm not saying I picked the bottom, but once the stock capitulated under 20 bucks, you got the one minute VWAP, right? And again, like I said, the one minute VWAP leads into the multi day VWAP, which led into the reversal. So if you find a trade that is breaking 52 week lows and then recaptures the one minute, that's the beginning of your trend reversal. But that's not where the trade really takes off. It's when you get through a multi-day VWAP. So this one, you know, got back above the one minute around twenty dollars and seventeen cents. Um, if you guys want to follow this along, this was yesterday, and this is how my trading evolves from day trading to swing trading to possibly I don't want to use the word investment because I don't I don't really generally hold too much anymore. I let let my father do that. But the evolution of this trade is that once it got over the one minute, capitulated under twenty. You got back above the opening range at around twenty dollars and forty cents, and then our multi-day VWAP at the time was. Let me just get the price exactly for you. The multi-day VWAP was that twenty and a half. So once it got past the twenty and a half, now we're thinking, all right, <clears throat> that stock may have put a bottom in. So our day trade started at twenty and a half, and that thing took off to the end of the day. So because it trended right to the close, which is the only time we take an overnight, if the if the day trade Again, most traders, their swing trades are basically day trades that didn't work. Well, I guess it's a swing trade now because I didn't sell it, so I guess I'll hold on to it for a couple more days. For us, we try to take the swing out of the good day trade. So today, again, for the guys that weren't in it with me from yesterday, it provided us another setup. And again, this is what we call the follow-up of – this is a follow-up to the bottoming process. The next day – that stock shows some weakness at the beginning of the day, but if it then again breaks back over the VWAP and the opening range, it then confirms the bottom that the stock put in yesterday. So we decided to hang on to it for another day, and so far so good because now we got the stock. Our entry is twenty dollars and about sixty-five cents, and we're up to twenty-two sixty-five. So not bad, ten percent move overnight. Can't complain. And, uh, you know, basically that's the, I don't know if that answered your question. But, well, I mean, I, you know, we're going to jump on a price chart after this anyway, so we can have a, maybe have a look at that in particular and, and talk about a few other things. So, uh, look, before we wrap up, what's the best way for traders to get hold of you? Um, you, can, you can email me. I go by the Warlock because I have got magical powers, but the wizard was taken. Right. Uh, 
the warlock at hit the bid.com is my email address. You can go to hit the bid. Um, there's a link where it'll, it'll email me. Usually you want to go direct. It's the warlock at hit the bid.com or info at hit the bid.com. If you Google my name, Kenny Glick, you will find a way to contact me. I also have an AOL address from, you know, 1999, Kenny Glick at AOL.com. You could always do that. <laughs> Um, but yeah, if you Google my name and, and hit the bid, you'll, you'll find my videos on YouTube and you'll find the website is, it's a pretty easy way to contact me. And like I said, anybody reaches out to me, I let you hang out with me for, for at least a month to get familiar with what I do. It, you know, sometimes if you show up on a, you know, a Thursday at one o'clock and nobody's saying anything, hang tight. Somebody will be on eventually. If not, then, you know, we go strong from nine to 12 every day. I mean, I was dying yesterday. I had, you know, some allergic allergic attack. I couldn't even see or breathe, and I still got on the air for three hours because I, I pushed through. Because I work at home, so all I got to do is crawl into my room, <laughs> throw the microphone on, and I'm, I'm talking. <coughs> oh, dude, you, you got to love this guy. <laughs> V-Wack. And I'm, I, I'm there every day for three hours. And, you know, again, I, I pride myself in this because, you know, a lot of people will sell you a class or a seminar and I've seen it. You know, I work for education companies charging tens of thousands of dollars. You know, there was a guy charging 12,000 bucks for a 10 day course and you got a, a pretty good education, but after those 10 days were over, good luck. See ya. And you know, they put you in a chat room and that's where I started getting into the whole chat room idea that, you know, after these guys got done, I'm not going to say ripping people off, but 12500 for 10 days was crazy, but people were paying it. And then they would come to the chat room, and there I was helping them reinforce mm. what they just learned. And the company didn't want to pay me to be in the chat room where all the magic happened. So I said, hey, I'll launch my own chat room. And they said, good luck. <laughs> and here I am. Yeah, look. So now I just do it. I do it all in the chat room. And if somebody needs extra, you know, a little hand-holding, I do that, do I do some side, you know, some side classes and, you know, but generally when people join my, my website, it's a, it's a membership fee. We, we, we basically call it a family. It's more of a club, uh, you know, a, a good group of people in there. We're all sharing our ideas. And if you're looking for camaraderie and obviously if you're looking to learn about VWAP and range breaks and how to be successful, we we're, we're just always talking in there. And I got guys that just love to talk. So when I get off the air, some of the guys that I taught are now the moderators and the presenters in the room, and they'll get on and talk about their evolution as a trader. So it's a learning process. It's, it's a great way to learn a, a, you know, from people that I've taught are now teaching other people, which is great. Cool. Perfect. Well, look, a big thank you to Kenny for sharing with us today. Everything we've discussed here, along with all the links, are going to be in the show notes to find them. Simply search for Kenny in the search box on tradingnut.com. Until next time, I wish all my listeners trading happiness and success. Right here, folks, so there we have it. Do remember to head over to the YouTube channel or just tradingnut.com to find that video we shot after the show. Uh, remember the four weasel words not to say this week. Ne- uh, what is it? Need can't try and bad okay and last but not least uh, if you want to see how we're tracking over there at the robot traders club go and check it out as well over there on tradingnut.com you'll see all the information there as well um, yeah that's it for me for the week hope you have a great trading week and i'll see you in the market